Hi, this is your president here welcoming you to uh, the BHS's beautiful Burley. Unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, we can't have a real Burley. Uh, but don't despair. Uh, in lieu of that, uh, we are going to catch up with some of the top riders, top owners, top coaches, and talk about their horses. And there's even a cameo appearance from one of Caroline Powell's horses, Legally Grey. So um, that's pretty much uh, as good as a real Burley. Thank you so much for joining us for this VHS virtual Burley. Um, I know that you're also doing one, which we'll come to talk about a, a little later. But start, could you start by telling us how long have you been involved with Burley and how did it all begin for you? I think more years than I care to actually admit to. Uh, I've been involved in the event um, from a working perspective for, dare I say, over 40 years now. But even before then, I was in the Burley Pony Club and uh, used to ride in the park every morning before school because our house was on the outskirts of the park. The Marquis at that time was president of the Burley Pony Club, so that was an amazing uh, opportunity to sort of first get a feeling for the estate in Burley Park. Uh, I then was a Pony Club mounted score collector, which was the highlight of my teenage years, I think. Uh, we don't have mounted score collectors anymore because the crowds are too big. An amazing way of of getting to know an event like that, doing it from the very beginning from, from a young person. Um, so if you've been there for 40 years, what do you think are the most significant changes you've seen over that time? Oh, gosh. Um, can I start with, um, and you'll be surprised to hear this, uh, the move from the long drop loose to the more modern loose that we see today? Uh, that'll perhaps <laughs> surprise a few people. We I thought we were... <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you and I d will do. And uh, I mean, I think um, that was absolutely incredible. You know, we were sort of really the forefront of everything when we did that. Um, but we, we also, we also uh, under Bill Henson, who was a director at the time, um, put in the amazing irrigation system on our cross country course. I think really upped the game. Um, we, we spoke to Lucinda Green yesterday and she said for her that was one of the real game changes, that the going, the conditions with the irrigation have been a real real um really make the whole event completely different that that's interesting actually to hear to hear someone like lucinda who um in my younger days was just the rider to be watching out for she also talked a little bit about the ridge and furrow disappearing and she said there were parts of the course in the past that um had been quite tricky for the horses with the with the undulations of that being in quite short spaces um, yes Yes. I mean, that took a lot of doing because we had to put liners in. For, I can remember that liners in for it because actually if the event ever ceases, um, I think that ridge and furrow probably has to go back because it's historic parkland. So all those elements that everybody loves about the event, the lovely backdrop, Burley House, the historic parkland, it all adds to the event, but actually it has to be managed and everyone has to work together to make sure that it's, it's good for all parties. I suppose all the behind the scenes stuff that we just take for granted that we'll arrive and have the most remarkable time whilst we're there. Um, sadly, this year, we're not going to. I, I guess for you, making that decision must have been one of the hardest possible things you've had to do whilst you've been in this job. Could you talk to us about how you came to that, that conclusion that you just couldn't run? Well, absolutely, it was. It's the first time in our, it's our 60th anniversary next year, and it'll be the first time in all those years that we've had to cancel. We were hopeful, to be honest. Um, you know, badminton cancelled, and we kept thinking, well, September's you know, many months ahead, and if we can do it, we will. And then as the weeks went by, you know, one half of me was saying, yes, we've got to do it. If there's a chink of a chance, we can do it. And we were beginning to think, how can we get over certain hurdles? Mm. Oh, it was difficult. It really, really was. But actually, it was out of our hands. There was no option. It, we had we had to cancel. So. And would one of the issues with like the coronavirus was actually the problem of horses not having had enough runs? Well, we did. I mean, I, I did speak to um, Richard Waygood and we had all those conversations because we were so determined we were going to run. <laughs> Never tell an event organiser they can't run the event. That's a really bad thing to do. Yes, it would have been a different event. I'm sure we'd have had to have taken that into account in the cross country course and the questions we were asking them, um, the level of difficulty, et cetera, et cetera. But um, where there's a will, there's a way. But unfortunately, um, the will was there, but the way wasn't this year. So I always absolutely love the quality of the trade stands. 
and the, the fact that there's always something there that you don't see anywhere else. Christmas shopping starts at Burley, doesn't it? Absolutely. Doing the tray stands is, is as an art as an, and as a science. And Jacqueline has a personality huge in the universe, I think. <laughs> and she just has this way. She trawls the, sh the sh summer show season, the winter sh show season, the magazines. And she always says, it's not what I want or what you want, Elizabeth. We have to really understand our audience. We have that lovely Burley House backdrop lovely wide avenues if you ever have time to stop and look back towards Stamford you can see I don't know how many church spires so it's a mixture of layout choice of product how they put on the site together but actually I just have the most wonderful wonderful trade stand secretary um, but I'd also like to say we have one trade stand that's been there since year one and it is in fact the British Horse Society trade stand and I think a lot of our visitors would not know that we owe our being a, to the Marcus of Exeter, who very, very generously gave his estate up, um, but also to the British Horse Society, because years ago, 61 years ago, our very first event, we were actually running under your umbrella. So I did think it was worth saying that on this interview. That's really fine, thank you. And we're, we love Burley as an organisation. Um, it's always great to see our members and supporters and volunteers, and we always have a, a great time. What can we see tomorrow from your programme? Well, at three o'clock in the afternoon, I believe, um, we've got a um, full programme um, up to 90 minutes, I think, uh, with lots of different features in. Um, there's going to be Strictly Dressage with Carl Hester, um, Nick Burton. Um, and we've got lots of features on riders. We're also encouraging people to make their own um, Burley picnic. I think... Uh, Land Rover Burley is renowned for its Saturday picnics. So it's the one weekend that I hope it will rain because I do want people inside watching it. Next you'll be 60 years of Burley. Yes. So a real special occasion, especially not having yes. anything else go ahead this year. What sort of things do you have planned for, for the anniversary? Um, we've got Derek de Grazia, of course, as our new course designer. Derek is the course designer for Tokyo Olympics. Fingers crossed the Olympics go ahead. But new cross-country course, fresh looks, 60th anniversary. So it'll be a great event. Liz, thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope, um, I'm sure I'll be sitting there on the sofa on Sunday afternoon glued to the television. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. OK. Well, Dickie, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, um, things are changing daily and weekly at the moment, but uh, trying to get, keep ahead of the game. Yeah, there was a bit of a hesitation after I asked how you were. That's why I was just a bit, bit concerned about that. Um, but OK, so, you know, very disappointing, obviously, that we haven't got a real live Burley that we're used to. But, yeah, the virtual brings other exciting opportunities. And so we're going to, I'm going to enjoy having a chat with you about your experiences at Burley. Um, first of all, though, what have you been up to on the eventing scene? What's happening? What Give us the current state of play. Um, well, we're back to, we had first international competition last weekend at Bergen, which was really big success. A uh, huge amount of runners in every class. Um Oliver won four of the internationals, which I think is a world record um, in, in, in a weekend. Um, but all of our horses, Ross was outstanding, Piggy was outstanding. There's so many outstanding performances to talk about. And what you would have been impressed with is the horses, because they this time in lockdown, their strength and conditioning and their top line and their technical skills way of going was fantastic. And the, the level of dressage was really, really good. So oh, lots cool. of positive. So they have, didn't seem to have suffered by not going out to shows during lockdown then? No, not not at all. Uh, the tracks were really good. They were sort of designed with that in mind that they hadn't been out and the going was amazing. But they'd all, you know, nobody sort of got there and decided not to run it was uh the going was good the sun was shining although it was a bit windy on cross country days but um no it was a really really good weekend and then national classes they've been kicking off for some time now um what i was really pleased about that we were on when we were allowed to return to training um i think it was the 25th of may now if we weren't the first 
sport we were amongst the first few because i know that morning when we were allowed to go to one-to-one we had the sops in place risk assessments and i was coaching at seven o'clock that morning so it was a pat on the back for equestrian sports yeah well i i echo that too we've been out um with the show jumpers to some training shows and actually some normal shows and i must say everybody's keen and eager to go but what i've really been impressed with is the organization and the covid protocol and how everybody's adhering to it and they're all ready and um yeah i think the system's working really well Lucinda, thank you ever so much for joining us to talk about this virtual Burley. We wonder, do you think there's a special type of horse that, that's going to win Burley? And if so, what sort of horse is that? Well, in the good old days, it used to have to be a horse with tremendous stamina because Burley used to have 10 rises and falls in its 13-minute cross-country. I think even though it's come down to whatever it is now, 11 and a half, it's still a, the toughest five-star in the world because of the terrain so a varying assortment of horses win it but they've got to be very fit and very um enduring they've got to be able to balance when they are tired because they're coming downhill near the end of the course yet another hill they have to come down to some big fences at the bottom and when tim price and very very nearly the win, eventual winner last year, Pippa, went down under the Lion Bridge just in open water. There wasn't even a fence um, as a part of the reason why they went down. I think that was the sort of thing that can happen when a horse is tired and mm. taking a pull, you've balanced them, but, oh, they just hit a bit of water and it just slows their legs down. And whoa, their balance just goes. It's a, a, a trap for the... For the for the rider who's always looking to save every second, they've still got to remember they've a horse under them that has just jumped thirty odd fences on a very very tough undulating ground. You and Burley twice, once on um, George, once on Pingle Bay. Did they have any similar traits? Were they very different characters? How did what were they no, like? No, no, they couldn't have been more different. Beagle Bay was a, a sort of unique pony, really. Yes, he was very pretty. And pretty being the operative word, because he, he was a little bit uh, Welsh pony bred, I think. And he had the cheek of the Welsh pony. I mean, he would stop in the collecting ring for the show jumping without me uh, ever realising he was going to. So he was very good for me, sharpened me up. But <laughs> I never really viewed him as the, the, the top class horse that he became. And one of the reasons was that he was quite hard to keep sound. His ankles would give way on him a bit. Um, but he did end up winning both Babington and Burley. So he was some horse. And from from my memory, Beagle Bay was cheeky, charming, and the pony. <laughs> <laughs> George was an entirely different kettle of fish because George was an, a German thoroughbred sire, San Georg. Um, so they were mix and match, but he'd already been taken around five-star events by the owner's son, Matthew Straker. And... Um, he, he'd already hit the top level long, long before I got him. Uh, I never quite believed he was the age that I was told he was <laughs> because he'd been around a long time and he felt a very old horse um, underneath me. He did incredibly at ba badminton to, to, to win it in difficult conditions, but not before he'd taken the, op the, the rail of the open ditch clean across the steeplechase fence. And, and it, it didn't bow him, it didn't falter. On he went, and, and he then went round the cross country in a most exemplary fashion. But then when he came to Burley, we had a pretty interesting steeplechase because I directed him down the wrong roped channel uh, uh, on the golf course and then realised that I was now heading for the finish, so I needed to get back onto the second circuit rope channel. So pulled him across to the ropes, and he galloped through the ropes, which twisted round his legs and he bowed right down in mid gallop and I fell off and I just remember being carted 
around the steeplechase for about I don't know how many yards with George not really aware that I wasn't on his back anymore. And I was sort of yanking at the reins, saying, whoa, 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 as I was on my bottom skiing along the ground with him still galloping. Anyhow, the extraordinary upshot of this story was that he did stop. He did realise I was there. I did somehow get back on, although I was unbelievably weak because my dad had recently died and I'd been on a fast for many months in, in sympathy with him. And galloped on to, to complete the sea is still inside the time so how that happened i will never know i had the the roads and tracks to sort of cogitate what an absolute mess i'd made and i was feeling so weak and so pathetic and then i had this sort of four and three quarter mile course of burly undulations ahead of me and i remember just going into the box at the end of the um roads and tracks and and sort of just feeling so weak I just went and locked myself in the loo until there was a bang on the loo saying Lucinda it's time to come out by my chef to keep because it was the European Championship so we were in a team and I remember Richard Mead just saying you can do it just get on there and do it you know there was no sort of niceties for how to jump fence six or 12 or 14 <laughs> it was just 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 they knew where I was physically and mentally probably not in a great place Anyhow, that darling horse was tired by then, uh, old, I think, but also tired. It was hot. And he went on and he did the course and three quarters of the way around. And I was thinking, I just do not know how I'm going to make this last quarter. He didn't feel particularly great. I certainly didn't. And the, by then it was five in the evening or so to speak. And people had just gone home and there wasn't much spectators around. And there was this one wonderful man in a very hot day in his tweed plus fours. And he raised his shooting stick and he bellowed as we galloped by, come on, England, come on, George. And I shall never forget it because that gave me what I needed to somehow get him under some sort of balance and control for the what was now the Land Rover fence. It was a very complex fence. And somehow he got me home with me giving him a little bit more help than I might have done if we hadn't had come on, England, come on, George. Incredible. What an incredible story. Lucinda, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's been a, a really lovely insight into um, some snippets from an amazing career. Thank you. Oh, bless you. Well, thank you for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, Berlin. So, I mean, Burley is iconic to us in this country. Well, actually, worldwide, really, isn't it, as a three-day event. What is special? What, why does it have that appeal uh, to the international eventers? Well, I mean, it's, you know, one of the jewels in the crown. You know, you could argue which way, but it is, you know, it's, it's right up there, as we well know. Um, the difference, what I like about Burley is because it's later in the season, the horses are really prepared, they're really conditioned uh, for, for the event itself. Um, the, the cross-country course with the undulations, the topography, it needs a special sort of horse that has a special engine to keep galloping to the end. And then obviously it's at maximum dimensions and with the technicality thrown in, it's a proper, I mean, proper ultimate five-star event um, and and it's very, very exciting. And the other thing around Burley is the fact that in these real horsemanship, you need to ride what's underneath you at that time. You can have a plan A, but you need to be very quick to go to plan B or to plan C or even to plan D at times and really be aware of what you're actually sat on at that moment in time, at that point around the cross-country course. Yeah, well, I suppose we've seen some thrills and spills or scrapes, um, which can actually happen to anybody, no matter how experienced they are. But especially, <laughs> OK, well, we'll come on to that. But uh, yeah. I was going to say, do you think that it especially catches some first timers out? Because, like you said, the undulations and the hill, and you know, they, they're not to be underestimated, are they? Oh, in the impact on the actual fence, fences themselves? No, I mean, there's one thing being qualified. There's another thing being ready for Berlin. And likewise with any, with any five-star. It's being qualified and getting that MER to turn up and ride there is one thing, but actually being really ready to be there, that's a completely different story. Do you think we better explain what MER means? 
Okay. Uh, minute. Yeah, minute. Yeah. One viewer, one viewer who doesn't know what an MER stands for. So, so now I'm going to stutter. Minimal eligibility requirements. Uh, yeah. Okay. Shall I see if I can say that? Minimum eligibility yeah. requirements. One thing that you can't underestimate when you're riding cross country at Burley is the you can't what i love about it you can't get lost because well, okay they've got string but there are just walls and walls of people and especially when you come down to the fences and for the horses are not used to that that can be quite you know quite intimidating and it does you do see some horses there we're talking about horses being qualified and being ready to go you do see some horses dry up a bit because they're looking at the people beyond the fences or, or around the fences and that can have a have a have an impact but um but also at the same time you know the uh in the in the main arena with the crowd on that last day when the last round to go the silence when you go into the arena the holding the breath and then, you know, last year is a classic example when Pippa had won that competition. Their crowd went absolutely wild. And it, it is something that we can all ride every fence or we can ride every dressage movement with the person in the arena at that time. If you look around it, nearly every single coach, um, as, as you're jumping a fence, they're lifting their leg up or as you're doing a passage of PF, they're jogging up and down, your whole bodies are moving with you and they're, they're, they're with you and the horse at the time. And, uh, no, that's a feeling that you've just, again, money can't buy. And it's just, I think it's so special to equestrian sports. Um, no, my, my, that just sticks in my head. Well, Jenny, thanks very much for joining uh, the, the BHS on our um, virtual Burley. Um, I mean, you won Burley five times in the 1980s, and you certainly were the sort of star of the show in the 1980s. But do you think there's a particular horse um, that, that, that goes around Burley? And what do you think makes a Burley horse? Golly, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult question because... I suppose one could say the same about what makes a good rugby player or a good tennis player. And I think um, the, the horse's brain is very, very important. That, that is kind of key. Um, and he may look, look like George Clooney and be absolutely gorgeous to look at. But if the brain isn't there, you know, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. So... I think that uh, their brain's terribly important. Their character, again, is important. Um, yes, their, their movement for the dressage, their ability to be careful, show jumping, but yet very brave across the country. It, it's a very difficult um, animal to find. An event horse generally is, actually. Um, so I, I always felt that until I'd gone to the finishing flags, I didn't know I was on a burly horse. I think uh, to, to have a really good burly horse, they've got to be able to change gears very quickly and very smoothly. They've got to, this is across the country, um, be able to be very technical one minute, then have massive scope the next minute, um, and endurance. Um, because in my day, we had the roads and tracks, the steeplechase roads and tracks, and then the cross country. Um, now the endurance isn't, isn't as tough, but it is still a very long way across the country. And it still really is um, a sort of energy sapping course. Well, do, do you think this has changed over the, over the years? I mean, um, back in the, the, the 1980s and today, do you think a horse would need exactly the same qualities or are there, are there differing ones these days? Well, I think actually it's pretty much the same. Um, what I would always um, advise people to do is to go to the first veterinary inspection. 
and you would be amazed at the different shapes and sizes of horses that are competing at Burley. You've got one at sort of 15-2, one at 17-2, one very kind of thoroughbred looking horse, one not quite so thoroughbred looking horse. And that, I, I find that A, very interesting and B, very exciting because there isn't a particular stamp. It's the package that really counts. Okay, well, you had, uh, you had four horses that were the package, um, Priceless Nightcap, Mossacross and, and Murphy himself. Did, did all those horses have similar traits? I mean, you mentioned the, uh, the qualities, but b between the four of them, um, how, how did they differ? Well, interesting enough, they were all very different. Um, Priceless was not a thoroughbred. He was, he was actually the least bred horse of all of them. But he had very big movement. He wasn't very big, he was 16 hands. A fantastic brain, unbelievably brave, very um, independent, not easy to train, actually, what? but a fantastic personality. And he, I think he came into his own because he, where he lacked a bit of thoroughbred, he made up with his unbelievable accuracy so you could make the time going across the country because you could turn on the sixpence because you could cut in and, and do something that probably somebody else wouldn't dare to do because he was just that talented i suppose um and so that's where he made up for his flaws in a way and then you've got um master craftsman who was george clooney there's no question uh beautiful looking, um he had everything. Um, so his flaw was his show jumping wasn't very reliable. He was a bit too brave. So that was his delicate area. Um, Murphy himself, um, he won Burley when he was only seven years old. Wow. Um, but he, he won Burley. I did not win Burley because I think it was four fences from home. He, he just took off. I could not stop him. And he I just literally steered and he got inside the time because he went faster than I wanted to go. And he managed to win early by point, something of a point. Um, but he, again, was very different, um, very big and long and rather gangly. Um, and then Nightcap was, again, different. Um, he was very uh, polite, lacked a lot of confidence, was very timid. Um, I hated noise and he had to be treated with kind of kid gloves in a way. Um, and I think half the uh, secret really is, is the training. Um, we had them all as four year olds and the fascination of, of trying to find out their personality, their character, where their flaws are and how, how to improve their little bits that aren't quite good enough. Um, and I, I, I have to say, I find that just as interesting as competing in a funny way. I suppose if Master, Master Craftsman was George Clooney, I should be asking you who uh, Price is not a cap and Murphy himself remind you of, but um, oh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, 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 Price's was definitely the Sergeant Major in the army. Oh, right, okay, okay right, I see. Nightcap was more of an officer, I guess. And Murphy, okay. he, he'd be out on the streets, Murphy, just really? causing trouble. Uh, but did you know that they all had that ability to, to compete at Burley? Or was there a, a moment when you thought, well, I'm not, I'm not quite so sure? I think that um, when, I, when I got the, each of them there, when they got there, I, I, I had a fairly good idea that they, they'd manage it win goodness knows you know one doesn't know that but i i was pretty confident that they were they were ready to go and ready to compete there yes definitely yeah and, and out of your five wins are you able to pick a, a, a favorite one or do they all um level out well they all level out they, they were all equally as exciting as each other but i think the very first burley win um was uh you know truly memorable because i i remember thinking well <clears throat> at least i've won one big competition and if i never win another one 
I can, you know, be super grateful that I've actually managed it and all the people behind me, you know, you're sort of giving back a bit and the sponsors and, and all that. So I think that was the most important one. You finally got there and you've finally done it. If, if, if you could have um, you know, any horse to, to ride around Burley, and I know you've got your four, but taking those to one side, um, is, is there any one that you think, oh, I'd like to have a, have a, have a pop at that one? Do you know, um, I was thinking about that question, and the answer is there are plenty that you look at thinking, God, he was a lovely horse. However, I would be, I'd have sleepless nights riding somebody else's precious horse, probably making a mess of it. So I've decided that I'd rather not, and I'll just stick to my boys that I know. <laughs> Right. Uh, but you mentioned their nerves. Um, how, how did that come into it? Did, it did, did, you, did you play with your nerves and use them in a, in a, in a positive way? Uh, I, you know, the, 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 the night before going around a, a, a four star course, um, I mean, you know, to, to me, it would just be, whoa. But how, how did, it, uh, did it occur to you? Well, I think waking up on Saturday morning, Without question, I used to wish I was somewhere else, anywhere, you know, anywhere in the world, just not here. Um, and I think, I, I think sports psychology is fantastic. And But we never had the opportunity of, of having that. So we were sort of self trying to work out how to deal with it in your own way, I suppose. And um, amazingly, you, you will find this difficult to believe, I used to go very quiet. So I, I went into my own bubble okay. and in my bubble for five days. And was that the same when you went into the, the show jumping round as well? Or was that a little bit um, less so? No. Oh. Right. <laughs> in okay. fact, I, um, I had a very nasty moment um, with George Clooney at <laughs> uh, Burley uh, at the European Championships um, because... He was, he was very difficult to show jump. And I had to be very, very um, um, accurate in how I rode him. I actually got halfway round and landed over a fence. And I was thinking about, right, you know, I must collect him back again now. I must get his hocks underneath him. Blah, blah. And I completely missed my turn to the gate. And mm. I, I walked. Can you imagine? I actually walked. And the crowds went, Ugh, like this. I thought, oh, please don't do that, because that makes it even worse. And then I thought, I thought, okay, I've got to go round the flank and then go to the to the gate. So luckily, I, I picked up the counter and on I went. And, and again, luckily, because he quite liked uh, to keep the speed up, I didn't get time faults. But it was a very, very nasty moment. And is there is there one horse that didn't make it that you really wished had? Um, well, luckily not. Um, well, that is not quite true. Um, Welton Houdini, um, who, lucky me, he won Babington. And I'd love to have ridden him round Burley. And we never yeah. did. That's so, yes, you're right. Yeah. Um, Why didn't he make it to Burley? Because he, again, luckily, got chosen for the European or um, something else, so he couldn't run at Burley. I wonder how he would have managed because he um, he found Babington quite easy, but I think he would have found Burley pretty tough because he was a slightly, um, slightly shorter strided horse. I don't know, it would have been lovely to have had to go with him anyway. Who knows? <laughs> Hello everyone, my name's Sophie and I am the manager of the passport process at the British Horse Society. I'm here to let you know about some legislation changes to microchipping horses in the UK that you need to know about if you're a horse owner.
So the new legislation means that all horses, ponies, donkeys and their hybrids need to be microchipped in Great Britain. Um, there are certain deadlines that you need to adhere to, otherwise there could be a fine that you may be charged if you don't adhere to this. So in England, the deadline is the 1st of October 2020. In Wales, it's the 12th of February 2021. And in Scotland, it's the 28th of March 2021. The legislation means that if your horse isn't already microchipped, it now does need to be microchipped, regardless of whether it has a freeze mark or not. If you've got any concerns about your horse being microchipped, maybe the reaction they have or if they're extremely needle shy, we recommend that you talk to your vet about that. So your vet will need to come and microchip your horse and the BHS recommends that you try and um, make this appointment at the same time that you would do, say, if your horse is having vaccinations or if there's a zone day to help you cut down on costs as much as possible. Once your vet has microchipped your horse, you will need to update your passport issuing organisation and that is the company that has produced your horse's passport. If you're unsure about who has done this, have a look to see if there's a name in your horse's passport and you can also search for the different PIOs on the DEFRA website. If you have a British Horse Society passport, then you head to our website bhs.org.uk and we've got plenty of information about how you update a British Horse Society passport. Once your PIO has been notified of your change of microchip to your horse, then they will upload this data onto something called the Central Equine Database. This is a really, really useful spot to have your horse's data. So it's all kept online and very securely. And there are different benefits to this. So first and foremost, it means that you can check uh, and alert people if your horse is stolen. Uh, you can also check if a horse that you're wanting to buy is actually legally for sale and you can store all of your horse's information on something called the digital stable. So if you head to equineregister.co.uk then you'll be able to find out lots more information about how to keep your horse's data safe and it also makes your horse searchable online using that new microchip number that they have. Now, Dickie, we've, we, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, the difficulties and the challenges of, of Burley. Uh, now tell us about how you've got on there, riding there. I've not ever had a great time. Really. No, that's a lie. I had one, you know, where it's funny how I was asked the other day to do an interview and I was asked about then highs and lows. And I just have a really selective, uh, I don't know what you would call it, a filter system that I can block out the lows really, really easily. And I don't know whether that's a positive thing or looking forward and putting stuff behind you. And interestingly enough, someone sent me a video the other day of me falling off it barely, and I can't remember it. I really can't. I've blocked it, obviously blocked it right out of my mind. Um, I can remember um, I had a really unfortunate experience one year where I did good tests as my first burley and then the horse overreached on the steeplechase and that was heartbreaking, beyond heartbreaking. It was an overreach that within, I don't know, five, four, five days of a, a, a bruising and, and um, it was a, a very small um, um, uh, cut, but it was nothing. And to to go to be prepared to do your dressage do phase a and then go on the steeplechase and then come off and uh, have to walk home that was that was heartbreaking um on another occasion i remember when they sort of said it was the biggest burley they'd seen for years and it was very very muddy that particular year and i hunted round and uh even then with all of those things against you you've still found yourself sort of up um in the sort of top half of the field at uh, that particular year, not many finished. But when I look back at Burley, it does take a special sort of horse. And you look at the 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 
the leaderboards or the or the scores and uh, flip through earlier. I think um, we've got Andrew Nicholson who's won five times there um, on. I think the only horse that's ever won three times is Avebury, um, and Avebury was owned by a mutual friend of ours, Rosemary Barlow. Um, and uh, Avery won three times back to back, which is uh, pretty impressive. And also to keep a uh, horse at that level for that many years is a is another amazing feat. And then you look at um, uh, Oliver's, you know, last year on uh, or sorry, year before on Ballymore Class. I mean, that went round and made the course look absolutely easy. Then you've got Pippa, you know, I mean, fairy tale story to come back and uh, do what she did last year. It was just uh, pretty, you know, that you couldn't help but, you know, bring a tear to your eye to see Pippa do that. And then you look back at Ginny Ling, five, five wins at Burley, Ginny Ling as well. But the one person who has knocked them all so far and holds the record, that's William. And he's won a record six times around Burley. If my maths are right and my recollections right, but six times is quite amazing. So, and that's pretty much on different horses as well. Yeah, I mean, you are naming the, the you know the greats of the eventing world there. And um, interesting with William, because I'm not sure about this, but would some of his wins have been when there were indeed roads and track spaces, or would they have been uh, yeah. after that? Absolutely, uh, before and after, they're quite spread over a number of uh, yeah. over a number of years. If my memory serves me right, so I think his first win was quite early on. Um, so he's he's won in both short and long formats. I mean, I am a favour. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm a, a, a fan of the um, shorter without the roads and tracks. I think it's uh, much better for the horses' welfare. Horses compete at that level at much more regular basis. Um, the horses have much more longevity in the sport and, you know, you're able then to run in a number of short formats through the year at, at four star short level. So you end up with more horse heroes, if you want to call it that, because they become more known because they have more chance at international level. Let me flip it. Your experience. Well, well, I'm, I'm, my experience is barely well my experience has been much much better than yours i have to say i've never really had any difficulty ride, riding at burley um and because basically i've only ever done the dressage race <laughs> because uh you know for a long time we, i did the dressage master class i know you you've also done it in recent years um but i did it for i don't know about 10 years in a row and um I do recall um, the excitement of, you know, the journalists and the buzz of the riders having walked the course on the dressage day. And uh, when I was riding up to the main arena to do the dressage demonstration, all in top hat and tails and the horse plaited up and all the rest of it, uh, I was stopped by one journalist who said, oh, have you got a minute um, for me? I just wondered, you know, all the riders are saying they're really, really worried about the course this year. Can I ask you how you think your horse is going to get, get on? And I said, I think he's going to get on absolutely fine. I don't see any problems at all. Well, she was so excited to get a rider's quote that wasn't, didn't think the horse was going to have any difficulties. So she got a pad out and wrote it down and... Uh, you know, as I was talking, I was noticing she was trying to look for the number on the horse's saddlecloth to identify which rider, this bold rider this was, that wasn't going to have any difficulty. And uh, anyway, she wrote down this great quote from me that I don't anticipate any problems, not even into the, the through the water or whatever. And as I rode away, she said, oh, do you mind if I ask you what number you are, what your name is on the, you know, what number you are on the start list? And I, I said, no, sorry, I've got to go now. So I, I don't know whatever happened to her quote, but um, yeah, so I've never had any difficulty on the cross country.
Thank you so much for joining us, Mary. Um, we're just going to ask you a few questions today about um, Burley and Burley Horse Trials. Um, all of our members are really missing not being able to get out and about. So it's a privilege for us to talk to you guys who are always out and about doing these amazing events. Um, uh, our particular focus is the horses because obviously uh, we don't always focus so much on them. We, we know more about the riders. So our first question is, do you think it takes a particular horse to go round Burley? And if so, what are the qualities that you're looking for in a Burley horse? Yes, I mean, it's you know, it's one of the toughest five star events in the world. Um, used to, in, in the olden days, it was, you know, badminton was the most difficult. Burley was slightly, you know, the ne next sort of um, most difficult and went from there. Whereas now Burley is definitely as difficult as badminton and, you know, some years more so. And I think what makes Burley, as well as obviously the amazing fences and the toughness of the fences, it's the terrain, the undulation, which badminton horse trials doesn't have. Badminton's very, very flat, um, maybe some gentle um, slopes, but Burley, you've got some, you know, big old sort of, you know, a, a, a lot of undulation. So, um, yeah, a, a right horse for Burley, you need a horse that is very tough and hard and one with tremendous stamina that can keep going. Um, the horses that lack the stamina end up running into trouble towards the end of the course at Burley. Um, so, you know, but yeah, the, the horses that have been successful are ones that are the sort of tougher type that will keep galloping to the end despite all the different terrain and, and the massive fences. Do you think the type of horse for Burley has changed over the years or has it remained fairly consistent or would a horse that was doing it now need different qualities um, to in the past? Well, I think only different qualities as in how the sport has changed. You know, yeah. in, the, in the olden days, we did all the roads and tracks and steeplechase before we went to cross country, you know, in the, the days of long format, as it was called. And the cross country courses were 13 minutes long, having already done all these miles and miles previously. So, um, you know, there's stamina um, and sort of endurability were, were even more important in those days within the whole sport. And um, yeah, I think Burley has only changed to the fact that it's now a short format. It's all courses are now more technical. So you need a horse that not only in the olden days, it was more you know, the big galloping horse that was brave would do well at, at Burley. Whereas now, as well as that, they've got to be nimble and, um, you know, think more for themselves. You know, be that little bit more maybe athletic type to be very comfortable around Burley. Why, why do you think it was Star Appeal that was the most successful at Burley? Was it a comment, you know, that just timing or training or mm -hmm. what made him the the one that took you to the top there i mean he was at the peak of his career when i managed to win burley and also he went on and won badminton horse trials as well um back to back which there's hardly very very few horses have done that so he he obviously was he was at the you know feeling best you know the best time in his life sort of body wise and experience wise um, and, you know, I think I was, you know, riding well as well. So to get, you know, as a combination, we were, you know, sort of at, at that top level. Um, I had a lot of success with the horse King Solomon, who was so opposite. That's when we were, when you asked me, what sort of horse do you need for Burley? I thought, well, actually, although Star Appeal is the only horse I've won Burley on, you know, Kit Deer, King Solomon, who was a totally different horse, as in, he was a smaller, thoroughbred, not brave as a young horse, was always slightly cautious, needed me to be brave, to fill him with bravery, um, compared to Star Appeal, who was this big, bossy Irish horse that just from day one that he went across country, he just wanted to forge on over whatever was ahead of him. And both... As King Solomon, although he never won, he was, I think I'm right in saying, third, fourth and fifth at Burley. So, you know, which is quite, you know, on consecutive years to be so consistent at that, that level of event. Um, 
So, yeah, so, you know, you, it, it's so much about what the horse is like inside and, yeah. <laughs> You've just said about King Solomon and Star Appeal, very different horses. What qualities are most important to you when you're looking for a new a new horse or that a horse is coming up the ranks with you? And um, does it depend on the, you know, does it depend on the, the, the discipline? Obviously, you're looking for eventing or um, the level that you want to take them to or or something else entirely maybe you just have all horses that you think can always make it to the top but it'd be really interesting to just find out a bit more yes you know it's so hard the more knowledgeable you get the more particular you are about you know trying to find that really good young horse and you might end up you know buying a horse with you know beautiful paces that's very athletic that's um you know a clean jumper and appears to be brave but you know he might as you produce him in his heart of hearts doesn't really enjoy it you know they've got to love what they're doing to be successful and consistently successful at the top level not just do it once and then end up you know sort of you know lacking confidence um so um yeah, so so much of buying a young horse. Okay, you can try to find a horse that you know moves and jumps and is athletic and the right type of height and with enough thoroughbred blood and all that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, it's their inside, their will and determination is what makes it as to whether they're going to be a winner at that top level. The um, vets inspection at a major three-day event. If you sit there and watch all the horses that have qualified say to run at Burley horse trials and you sit there and watch them all trot up in front of the ground jury you have little ones big ones fat ones thin ones the thoroughbred ones a bit more common ones and you know so and they've got to that level because they're the horses with the big heart and the, the love of the sport if you could have ridden any horse around Burley, whether this is a horse that you owned but didn't get to compete there um, or a horse that belonged to somebody else that you would have quite liked to have had the rounds on, is there any horse that you would think of? <laughs> or oh, a number of horses. Um, I never rode around Burley with King William um, because he was successful early in his years and was always picked to the team, you know, to pick to yeah. go on the team, whether it was an Olympics or a European. So because it, that always clashed with Burley, um, I would have loved to have ridden him around because, you know, again, in his heyday, he was just the most amazing horse to ride across country. It was effortless for him. And he finished, came through the finish, felt like you could just carry on and do the whole thing again. He had that sort of you know amazing power um but there are many many horses you know over the years um you know you think of mickey young his um sam you know but because but then you know because he was so successful with mickey and you know i expect if i raise him even be very good at all <laughs> but you know it makes you think oh i'd love to ride him and but i've been lucky um imperial cavalier was an amazing cross-country horse i came um, I think I was second at Burley with him. Um, and yes, I was, that's right, second one time. So he just we were just pipped by William Foxpit. Um, but he was a lovely horse to ride around those really big courses because he was so brave. But once the fences got that big, he was then a bit more careful and thought a bit more what, what he was doing. Your involvement with the um, Burley Young Event Horse, Richard, where did that start and how did that? Uh... Uh, well, actually, now that did uh, start a very long time ago, so long ago that I can't actually remember. But Bill Henson, who uh, you know and, and was the director of Burley, I'm going to guess, was it some one of the viewers can write in to say how long that Burley and Gavetto has been going? I don't know whether it's 15 years, 17 years, 20 years, I'm not sure. But anyway, he had the idea, the concept uh, to have to introduce a, a young horse, a young Gavetto series. And I remember that he got uh, assembled a meeting with Judy Bradwell, who, of course, 
not only I, I has won Burley, but you know has produced endless um, champions and, and, and horses in the Young Bay Tour series and judged at Burley. Uh, she was in on the meeting myself and and some others, and uh, basically Bill said he wanted to you know have had this idea to produce. A, a shop window, really, um, for breeders and producers of young event horses, um, and turn it into a series with the final there. And I and I remember saying, okay, well, you know, I think this is going to work, providing enough of the horses that start in the, the finals actually go through and make top top event horses. And so we had to work out a criteria. Um, that would ensure that it wasn't just a, a sort of a world within its own, but but it actually did fed the international sport. And I think if you look through, you'll see a, a, a lot of horses that have come through and grades. And that's I think that's the real litmus test for any of those kind of concepts with uh, material classes. And and so consequently, they review it every year. Yeah, I think. Well, it ticks so many boxes. I mean, first and foremost, you know, we have to accept that we, you know, we're a long way behind with our breeding lines and, and it's really then put the focus on, um, you know, breeding horses and their lineage and breeding horses just specifically for purpose. So that's been great. It's been a, it's wonderful, uh, for those who produce horses and take them to that level to, to either sell on or to carry on with themselves. Uh, for the owners, you know, it's a wonderful place to be part of the journey from the very beginning and through. And it's a great shot window for the sport. So you could, you know, in so many different ways, that, that class, because what a, a lot of people won't realize around the country, there are qualifiers and that is the, you know, that is the championships, you know, that is the final. So it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's gathered so much momentum and all for the right reasons. You can't say anything but good about it. And it's done in a way that for those baby horses, that it's not putting them under undue strain or stress, both mentally or physically. So perfect. Yeah. Hi, Tina. Thank you so much for joining us today at Beautiful Burley. How are you today? <laughs> Yeah, no, good. It's been raining today, actually. So, uh, yeah, a bit, bit of funny weather. Uh, we've had all weathers about riding the horses, but um, yeah, evening time now. So time to settle down with a glass of wine. So, Tina, you've evented since you were 16 and won many medals at Europeans, World Championships and the Olympic Games, um, including Team Silver at London in, um, on the lovely Miners Frolic. What did it feel like to take him to the Olympics and win silver on home turf? Oh my goodness. It was such a long, it was a long, it's a long time getting there. And it was a, an amazing sort of end to his career, really. Um, because I'd had him since he was four years old. Um, he was bred by, um, Maurice Pinto, who was an owner of my father's. And he retired from horses and, and sold up his property and he sent, one horse to me and one horse to my brother to train as a racehorse, which was Minus Follick's half sister. And um and it really sort of went from there. And as a young horse, he 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 was quite nervous, quite insecure. And, you know, I had to build up that partnership with him all the way through and and to end up being an Olympic horse. It wasn't obvious straight away he was an Olympic horse. Yes, he was thoroughbred and he was beautiful. Um, and a very kind person, but whether he was an out and out Olympic horse, you, 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 you never really know until you've gone through the grays. So, of course, it was truly amazing. Um, and of course, the, the long story of him being ill the year before, so I wasn't expecting to go. Um, and so to, to be selected and, and to compete there on home turf in front of a home crowd was truly amazing. I know you produce a lot of your own young horses and you competed minus Rollick in the young event horse classes at Burley and he won the five-year-old class in 2003 I think so I know you said you didn't you weren't aware of his star potential straight away but did when he won that did you sort of think there was something special about him then? It, 
because he was quite uh, weak and, and uh, backward as a five-year-old, I hadn't planned to do that much with him. Um, I don't do a lot with my uh, with my horses as young horses because I love to see them uh, flourish and, and actually have them longer at the, the top end, really. Mm. Um, if I've done all the work, it's lovely to enjoy them uh, um, being team horses. And Miles Follick was one of them. I'd only done a couple of B100s. Um, very averagely because he was a bit scared of going into water and I thought to get him out and about to do the young event horse classes uh, they're a great opportunity for the young horses to see the crowds but not have too much pressure um, and so I did that with him and took, he got qualified and, and got to the championship and he was typical thoroughbred wouldn't have been the sharpest and snappiest with his front legs but he wanted to be careful so I went there very much for the experience not thinking in a million years that he would necessarily win it and I have to say I can't actually remember who the judges are now which sounds awful um, but they obviously saw through that sort of goofy babyness of, of him because there are there are some horses that are very produced and that have maybe competed as a four-year-old and as a five-year-old so actually when they get there they're quite experienced but so he was quite green and quite naive and so to actually to come out as as the champion was yeah oh god it was amazing and then fantastic and as i said that the, the judge the people that were judging him obviously could see his potential and I then actually did put him on the market to be sold and, and nobody was really that interested. And so I brought him out. I actually hunted him uh, for, uh, for a couple of seasons just to just to sort of toughen him up, really, um, and, and brought him out. And then his owners, some owners of mine, Sarah Pelham and, and Nick and Valder Embry Costa that had owned horses with me before, said, what's that, you know, young horse, you know, can we get a syndicate together and 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 buy him from you? And I needed the money at the time, and so I said yes. And so it's really sort of gone on from there. Yeah, well, thank God no one bought him when you first put him on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's the way things work out, isn't it? Yeah, definitely he must have been fate for you. <laughs> so, do you think um, in, like the young event horse classes, especially at Burley, um, are quite important for starting young horses, and that kind of gives them that experience to start off with? Um, or you said you don't normally, you don't always pick them. Um, I it, it's it's get it's got very competitive now. I said from the from the years of of when I had the, like the minus folic of this world that was a very green green horse. Um, now it's quite a com uh, it's quite competitive. You get more of the warm blood type horses that would be would show a lot of technique over a fence as a young horse it's a very good selling platform um if if you've got to producing horses to, to sell to clients and it's a great place for clients to go and watch horses and see how they perform you know for a lot of horses they wouldn't have seen an atmosphere like that in their life so it's a great stepping stone for them uh in their international career to go there and it's very obviously very prestigious as well and so i know you competed minus frolic in the five-year-old class but did you ever manage to take him around Burley, or was he too busy on the teams <laughs> um, no he actually never did Burley. he had an amazing career um but when he he got you know to the olympic games um as a 10 year old and um he then was always in a in a british team so obviously a, t a championship is usually about the same time as burley so actually he never got a chance to, to compete there. i've obviously ridden many horses around burley but he would have been amazing um because he's thoroughbred and he was fast and you know up and down those hills to have to be on a horse with a lot of blood um, makes all the difference when you're you're going for the time and everything. So, you know, it was it was a shame, but equally he was representing his country. So you can't ask more than that. But he had an amazing career. I mean, he he, he took me to places to two Olympic games. He won medals at both Beijing and London. So there's very few horses that have ever won two lots of medals at and to make it to two Olympic Games is mm -hmm. a feat in itself. Um, he's a very kind, gentle horse and he was very trusting of me. Um, I was very aware of that when I produced him. Um, I was very careful at each level um, 
to make sure that he was very confident and very happy at each level as he went through the grades. And, mm -hmm. you know, we then obviously built up this great partnership and he, he's, he probably wouldn't have been the most athletic and scopy of horses in the world. But he had this real will to want to please me, which was fantastic. And, and that's why he was so good cross country. And he really tried in the show jumping phases, even though, you know, his tech, there'd probably be horses with a better technique show jumping, but he really wanted to leave the fences up and that's what made him into a champion. And, and as he had, survived the colitis just before uh, the London Olympics. Uh, he'd got very ill, he'd had a reaction to antibiotics and we thought we were going to lose him. So it, it was a very up and down uh, last few years of his career and, and he overcame that and I managed to get him qualified for the Olympics. I managed to do well enough to get selected yeah. and for them to go and jump that clear round and give us Team Silver was truly amazing and he put every ounce of effort into that because he'd really only just recovered from the colitis and the mm -hmm. and near death time he was very 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 ill um and so when it came to the individual he did have a couple of fences down which was unlike him but he had used every bit of energy for us to get our team medal so yeah. oh, look, you know uh, i can't ask any more from that and uh last question i think but have you got many young horses um, that you're producing at the moment and any that we should be looking out for in the future I have I've got um some young horses and some some horses that I've bred um so I've done a little bit of breeding um so I've got um a couple of uh, mares that are by Billy Mexico uh, Mexican law is one of them that shows a great technique and and she is really brave as well and so she could be really special um so I've got horses coming through the through the greys. I've got obviously Billy the Red, who is uh, a world class Olympic horse. So mm. with all the lockdown and a quiet season this year, I decided not to bring um, my two top horses out and to uh, save them and bring them out next year for badminton. So that was my decision. Um, I'm concentrating on my young horses and my daughter, who's 15, who is so keen and thinks this is amazing having lockdowns and not going to school so not going to school and riding horses all day so she's been riding a lot of my horses and has poached a few off me so to be honest, my, my life and career is 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 I'm still want to be at the very top level but there's also a, a part of me that is now supporting my daughter and trying to produce horses uh, for, for her um, yeah. to to have an amazing career that I've had Definitely. Yeah. Well, we look forward to seeing you back out there again next year, hopefully when things are returned to a bit oh, yeah. more normality. <laughs>The other thing is, well, it's obviously you get to know a great group of people that actually are sponsors and that's the owners. And during the course of this, I mean, how many times have you been on the kiss and cry when an owner's got hold of your arm and they're cutting off the blood flow because they're squeezing so hard, you know, when their horse is going around? Or some of the some owners can't watch. They, you know, they look the other way or they won't come on to the kiss and cry and they can't watch until it's all over. So, uh, that, you know, the, the, um, the emotions around that, the intensity is quite, quite, quite in incredible. The owners are the unsung heroes along with, the grooms and not just the grooms that some you know sometimes we do see on the tv or do get on the kiss and cry but actually the grooms left at home to keep the next lot of horses which could be going out two days later you know so it's the whole team isn't it that, um it was such a big team behind a quest behind one horse um and you know that's i think why it's so special and places like burley and victories uh, like Burley or even personal victories because it's not just the winner it's you know if somebody completes Burley it's a massive achievement isn't it for everybody oh yeah I mean uh, you know completing the five star and, and completing you know uh, when you look, walk the course at Burley um, and some of the competitors are just a completion that is their objective you know you've got the ones that are, that are being competitive 
You've got ones that just think, okay, my objective is I've got a young horse is just to look after it and navigate round and invest in that horse's future. And then you've got other competitors is just to get the tick in the box to get through the, through, through the, um, the, the finish line. And then, you know, in that, um, that, that sort of last box, you still call it the 10 minute box, although we, it's not 10 minute box any longer. You, you talked about the, the grooms, but in there, you know, what, what everyone doesn't get to see, it's like a Formula One pit stop and those horses come in, girths are slackened off, boots are uh, taken off, cold ice water is put on the horses. There's normally one person working on each side of the horse, one person leading the horse, one person taking off the, the saddlery. The riders wants to pat the horse and talk to the owners and talk to the uh, team staff or talk to the coach. But at the same time, Claire Bolden's trying to grab them for a, for an interview because she wants them while they're still a little bit out of breath and a bit emotional and all that. So the whole the whole thing there is it can be quite frantic. Um and it's something that um, I, I, you know, it sort of epitomizes that teamwork. That's when everyone is all hands to the pump. <laughs> Rosemary, thank you so much for coming to join us today to talk about Virtual Burley. I know that you're not really at home in front of camera, but we're so excited to find out more about Avery and some of your amazing event horses. Could you tell us how did it all start for you? Um, did you event as a youngster or? No, I hunted as a small child all the way up until about the last five or six years ago. And then I actually went to the World Equestrian Games with a great friend in 1978. And uh, I realised that I thought there was something I could do to help. And this friend then we went in a sort of partnership together and she evented the horses throughout the season which was much shorter then and I hunted the horses in the winter. How did you end up becoming having horses with Andrew? Well when this girlfriend stopped Andrew and Jane his first wife had just come out, come back from New Zealand and they went and took the yard which is in the next door village to us. Right so you got to know them? And we got to know them and we then sent them a horse was this one that you'd bought yourself? It was the unrideable spinning rhombus. Oh my goodness. So he was your first real... I wouldn't say first. My husband bought him. I thought, what the hell has he bought? <laughs> and supposedly as an event horse, a polo pony, a race horse, but it didn't quite work out like that. And he, we had a lovely girl working for us and it was almost, he was almost unrideable. And so he went up the road to Andrew and sadly Camilla our daughter never got to event him and uh, the rest is almost history. And you had a, a I mean for a, a horse that you bought for, for not very much money what an amazing career so he was third at Burley? Uh, he was third at Burley before he retired and he actually bought the house down because he jumped a clear round which he had never done in the history of his <laughs> he had cross country but never show jumping, ever oh, show jumping. Amazing. And it, Malcolm Wallace was commentating at the time, and he said, for those of you who don't know this horse, that was a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> and Rosemary, I've always noticed, I admire you have the most beautiful brooch of him, and his nickname was Piggy. His nickname was Piggy. Um, do you, can we have a little, would you mind sharing it with us? Um, the Flying Pig. Absolutely beautiful. And he was known as the Flying Pig. <laughs> so this is something I covered, is Rosemary's beautiful brooch of her horse. You have been an absolute stalwart of the what horse trial support group and have probably raised tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. And I think are... we go over a few million. Goodness gracious. Mm. Um, and you did it for many years incredibly successfully and I think your hospitality is known worldwide. Could you tell us about some of the highs of, of, of that? Because I know Well, the horse trial support group started after that trip to the World Equestrian Games by the late Martin Whiteley who I'm sure you've all heard of. And he wrote to 100 people and asked them to give 100 quid. And I was one of the 100 that gave the 100 quid. And then the late Lawrence Rook, Major Lawrence Rook, also very, very famous, um, he said he, think, he thought I should go on the committee, which I duly did. And um, I was given the job of sort of doing the hospitality with the support group. And then before 
world class and the lottery funding, British eventing, as it is now known as, um, said they couldn't afford to send the three day event teams to any of the championships, so the Horse Class Support Group fundraised for the teams to go to the championship. And talking of brooches, you had a special one made as part of the fundraising activity. Would you can would you show us that one? Because that equally is absolutely stunning. I designed that, and it was made by Garrard, the Crown Jewellers, and we had twelve made, and that is number one. Incredible. And how much money do you think those made for the for the team? Oh, it's so long ago. I really <laughs> can't remember. But but Garrard were very very um, helpful and and and, they, and there was a really nice well two really nice people who I got to know quite well. So you know, I would guess that you would have thought that um, spinning rhombus probably was your horse of a lifetime. Um, how did you come then to find Avery? We've had horse, ever since spinning rhombus. We had horses with Andrew. Some good some not so good, and a lovely horse called Duddles, who the children used to call Cuddles, and he was a very <laughs> affectionate horse, but he went wrong, and I thought that I would like to have another one, and Andrew and I discussed it, and he said, well, the only one I've got for sale, well, I think it's for sale, <laughs> is um, Avery, Buddy, which actually was being ridden by Wiggy, Andrew's second wife. But um, Wiggy had gone somewhere and Andrew hopped on him and decided, hmm. But when I saw him, he was quite big. Well, he's not, he wasn't very big, but he was quite chunky. But he was by Jumbo, who would have a fair amount of... Um... Yes, out of a thoroughbred mare. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what is extraordinary, I'd gone down to Andrew's to collect doubles because he was going to be retired or just go hunting or hacking about here. And... Um, I was in a big lorry and I went winging round the corner and I nearly ran into the school bus and it said Avebury on the front. So I came home to Mark and I said, I'm sorry, we've got to have it. There's a bus named after him. Brilliant. Had to be fate. Was, had to be fate. It had to, it had to be fate. But um, he was very, very naughty when he was, when he was younger. Very what, naughty. What age did you have him at? So he'd competed with Wiggy. He was competed... He was competing with Wiggy. He was then sold to be to a friend of Wiggy's to be sold as uh, as a show jumper, but he didn't quite make it. Right. So they brought him back for Wiggy to ride. I would have to look through the records because I can't quite remember um, exactly how old he was. But he went all the way through the grades. And when did you start to have a sense that you'd got a real superstar on your hands? When he won the one star at Tassels in Ireland, and then the following year he went back and won the two star. And but he had this quirk, and he would either dive off to nine times out of ten he'd dive off to the right or the left at sort of corners and things like right. that. And most of the course designers would say, "There's a fence out there with Buddy's name on," <laughs> which was, as you can imagine, really. Gave me sleepless nights. I'm night. sure. But um, no, he was a real character, a real character. He was pretty faultless towards the end of his career in terms of. He was, country. absolutely, absolutely. And he loved cutting corners. And Andrew, there's an expression um, which Andrew, you, I rode him like I stole him. <laughs> and actually, that's how. And I, I remember sitting down with Andrew one night and saying, Is it really worth it? He said, Trust me, trust me, it is worth it. So we went on with him. I would say the nightmare was a, was a cross country, just in case he was going to do, we called it doing a buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, no, he was, he, was, he was fun to watch all the way through. And could you watch? I mean, I know a lot of people who I own horses who watch, kind of... I couldn't, I couldn't always watch. And I remember once being up at Burley and somebody who should be nameless knocked on the loo door where I was inside. He saw me go <laughs> and he said, don't worry. He called me, Rosie, you can come out now. He's just jumped to clear around. Oh, incredible. Um, so, so that was incredible. And do you have a favourite of the three wins there? I suppose the first is, well, that's difficult to say. I'm not sure whether, actually, no, maybe the last one, actually, 2014. Because he had such a fantastic year that year. He had won Barbary for the fourth time. Hmm. And he'd also won the Open at Gatcombe. And then he went on to win 
Fairly. Incredible career. Very incredible career. And he had stayed pretty sound. Uh, and Andrew adored him, and he absolutely adored Andrew. He'd almost follow Andrew around like a little puppy. <laughs> and the children all loved him too, all loved him. And sadly, you know, we lost him to cancer in 2015. Was it 15 or was it 16? It was after Andrew's accident, because he was due to go to Gatcombe. And Andrew decided that he thought the ground at Gatcombe wasn't quite right, need not 100%. And then Andrew had that horrendous accident, of course. Mm. And then he, he never competed again. Gosh. And then he got the cancer. Very, very sad. But mm. I suppose he'd, he'd given his all. He was the most incredible horse. Yeah, but no horse deserves to go like that. No. I went no. down to see him and he was very happy. Lily, Andrew, and with his daughter, was riding him about. And he was so good with her. He was so kind to her. And... Um, then Andrew rang me and said, he's got a lump on his jaw. I think we should get it checked out. Mm. And then it started growing. I mean, growing in quite frightening form. But Wiggy and Andrew were incredible, absolutely incredible. And he's buried with them. Oh, a very sad end, but what an incredible I know, voice. I know, incredible. And I can't really bring myself to have another one. I know, no, I'm, no, no. He was just, he was a horse of a lifetime. Rosemary, thank you so much for getting these out. What a treat to see some of the um, some of the winnings. So could you talk us through some of these amazing trophies? And, and Let's start notes. at this end. That is for winning the British Open in 2014. Sadly, the Bar Barbary trophies all had to go back. So we haven't got... The, we've had, rep not replicas, but we've had... Um, one, two, three are 12, 13 and 14 for Burley. That was when era when um, Avebury was conducted into the Hall of Fame for era the Event Riders Association, and that was yes 2015. And these are Avebury's Sport Horse Breeding Trophies from Burley. Absolutely amazing! Thank you so much, Rosemary, for getting these out for us to have a look at. Thank you so much for joining us, Lucinda. I've just got a few questions to ask you today to find out a bit more about you and your ride, Headley Britannia, around, uh, around Burley. So first question, do you think it takes a particular type of horse to go around Burley? And if so, what for you makes a Burley horse? I've ridden some really different horses around there. I think probably the easiest one was um, a thoroughbred horse uh, for me. Um, but it, it's a really powerful course. You know, there's a lot of turning and jumping fences on different terrain, you know, uphill, downhill, sideways. There's a, it, it does require a lot of power. Um, so, you know, it was my first four star or five star um, with Heli Britannia. And I remember saying to Yogi Breiser, um, he was really kind, although I was riding for Australia at the time. Um, I was, he agreed to walk the course with me and he said, you know, you've got to believe in your horse. Um, and the, the biggest thing about Eddie Britannia was she, she did have that will to win and bring, you know, just that real aggression that she had or we had together. Yeah. Would you need a different sort of horse now to when you previously rode it? I think now that there's no uh, Rosen Tracks or Siebel Chase, I think you can get away with um, a less blood horse. Um, that Rosen Tracks and Siebel Chase was the true test of stamina. Then please, can you tell me a little bit more about Headley Britannia and, and your career with her? Well, 
a very long story, but I'll try and make a short one. Um, <laughs> she, she, um, she came to me to be sold uh, at the end of 2001. <clears throat> I had three professionals come and try her. They went, nah, you know, too short in the net, too short striding. Um, oh, no, can't jump this, whatever. Um, so I rode her for the, the owner for a season and she ended up, uh, I think was second to William Fox Pitt at Gatcombe Intermediate Championships, fastest time of the day. Uh, she won Blenheim. Did quite a lot of show jumping with her the first winter I got back after having Ellie in the October. Um, and then just thought, gosh, just keep going, keep going. Uh, we went to Le Moulin, I think in 2005. Um, and she fell. She had a one and only fall in the water at about 26. And she got her home. She was terribly ill she just had some virus picked it up don't know what she was in literally on death's door for three or four weeks and she fought back from that and came back uh to go to Bukalo at the end of 2005 um and then we went back to Lemoon in 2006 and the third reserve for the Arkan World Games only reserve um, and, I, and I was really, really, really upset because the course was amazing. But actually, um, uh, we had a, an entry into Burley uh, and was lying second in the dressage, uh, second after cross-country behind Andrew Hoy. And, of course, it was the year Andrew Hoy got the, uh, was about to win the Grand Slam. And I show jumped clear and he didn't, so I won it. Uh, <laughs> I did go to Rona. I did go up to Rona to say, to the guys and say, look, you know, I've just saved you from giving Andrew Hoy 250 grand. You know, how about giving me a wash? You know, this latest <laughs> one is fine. And they went, oh, no, 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 we can't possibly do that. Um, <laughs> so then the following year went, went to Babington. Um, and it was a year where it was terribly hard. And I led from Thursday, which um, I was number 32. Um, and uh, it, no one had led over one badminton from the first day. For I, don't, I actually don't think they've even done it since. I, I'm not sure. Potentially there, there has been, uh, but I don't think they have. Um, and it was really tough because Brit hated the hard ground. I hated running on the hard ground, but I was in the lead. What was I going to do? So um, I didn't really enjoy it. I have to say, I just felt sick the whole time. And Saturday night was just dreadful. I just thought, I hope I haven't hurt her. And um, anyway, she came out and dug deep and, and won. But I did have a rail down, but I had a rail in hand. Um, I think five from home. I had one, two, three, four, five fences yet to jump. Oh, my God. I've never been so nervous, I think, because I, because of the potentially the damage I could have done to her. You know, she wasn't built to run on hard ground. She was, you know, hammered into the ground a little bit and whatever. Um, she had to go double speed than anybody else because she had such little legs and such a little stride. Yeah. So she was, you know, a freak, really, and not because of her ability, absolutely not, just because she had this incredible uh, heart um, because she wasn't over bold. She, she, you know, she didn't like the ground or somewhere. She'd go, mm, that's not safe. I'm not jumping that. <laughs> <laughs> she was unreal. So clever and so bright. And yeah, we all thought the world of her. What qualities are most important to you when you're choosing a horse? Does it depend on the discipline, the level or something else entirely? Unless it's got the temperament to train it and to compete under pressure or at that level that you want, you might as well have a horse with less ability, hmm. more trainability, and a temperament that suits what the rider needs themselves. If there was any horse that you would have liked to ride round Burley, then um, who or who would that be? <laughs> Gosh. That's a question. Uh, you know, I need a bit of preparation for that one. I haven't had any preparation for it. Um, <laughs> so one of the most fun horses I've ever ridden around Burley was Prada. Actually, she was a black mare that um, 
uh, is now she but she was too hot in the dressage. Just too hot. But oh my gosh, was she fun to take cross country? Um, oh gosh, get smart in the old old days. I think Get Smart was one of Karen Dixon's horse. He would have been so much fun to ride. Um, there, are ma- there are a lot of amazing horses all around, uh, but you have to never lose sight of the fact that the riders are also phenomenal. I mean, you look at now, you look at Piggy March, you look at Izzy Taylor um, on the girls' side. Um, I think those two are, and actually Sarah Bullimore, I think she's a beautiful rider as well. So you've got those three riders. You know, I always think if I had a horse, who would I put it with? Hmm. Um, and who would I want my daughter to ride like? Um, and I think I, any of those three. Yep. What's your, what's the, your most memorable moment on, on horseback? Oh, do, do you know, sort of everybody asks that, but, and my mind always goes blank, a bit like, you know, your ability to blank things out and you know, bad experience, which, by the way, I meant to tell you, it is not a surprise to me. I've, I've often noticed that when it's your turn to get around in, you know, there's a sort of moment <laughs> that we love. But, um, uh, uh, but actually, now you've sprung with something, I mean, what's my memory? I've got lots of mem- memorable moments. Um, I, we've only got a limited amount of time. I suppose you've got to say um, you've got to say London, the, the, the Olympic Games in London. Uh, I don't know whether it's because of the you know for, for me personally the, the the horse memory, but I just think about the competition, the spirit yeah. of the thing the spectators the games makers was quite incredible i don't think i'll ever forget forget that impact um and you know other than that i could go on and on and on because i've got lots of lovely minor more horsemanship type of things uh you know when horses have a breakthrough of learning things and finally get it right um you know so they're probably not terribly uh, glamorous moments but you help us out to, to give us yours you dicky you've always got lovely i don't know that it, it's one of those it's a little bit like yourself i've been really really lucky and privileged to you know be part of your journey and the dressage team journey and the events in it at the moment and now the whole thing but um i've got very fond memories of my sort of military days i can remember you know, riding down the Champs Elysees with sixty horses, all in ceremonial uniform, to riding on many different ceremonial parades, to um, galloping across the Masai Mara, and um, I once did that doing Troika. You know, standing on two horses' backs in amongst the wildebeest, which was just quite an incredible thing to do. And um, then I went to the sixty-first cavalry in India and spent some time there, and that was just incredible. Um, you know, their mounted units is in Jaipur. Um, and yeah, so there's all those sort of fond memories. I can remember, um, we did a state visit at Edinburgh and we trotted down the Royal Mile from the castle down to Holyrood Palace. And it was a, what you call a double standard sovereign's escort. So there was a roughly 121, a uh, few more, but, uh, the mounted ceremonial soldiers. And then we um, we took the left uh, exit out of the sort of quadrangle at Holyrood Palace and we cantered up the Galloping Glen round to Arthur's seat in full ceremonial uniform. And those sort of things, you know, just money can't buy. So it's uh, – and then once I can remember jumping six foot one and a quarter on an army horse, which is quite incredible because that same horse would trot up and down the mile on, a, you know, on the ceremonial parade. So – the stories go on and on. Um, well, yeah, but well, actually, on that note, I am a bit disappointed that in your list of memorable moments, you know, you don't include my lessons with you as a young lad. Oh, you know, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I think you're, 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 but you've forgotten that bit as well. 
Um, hold, on, hold, on, hold on two seconds. Let me butt in. Hold on, everyone at home. Just let me just uh, say, I can remember driving up to see Richard Davis and having dressage lessons with him. It's the most highlight of my career. It was unbelievable. There you go, Richard. Good plug. Okay, that was, that, finally, you got to the right answer. But uh, obviously, Vicky, I have to have the last one because I've just actually recalled uh, one of my uh, most memorable horseback competition moments and it's a it's a, there's a bit of a sad note of this one because a bit like london being you know obviously the olympic games on home soil uh now i've forgotten the date it might have been 2003 i'm, I'm not sure but the european dressage championships was at hickstead um and you were there actually vicky uh, but yeah. it was at hickstead and um, it'd been a long time since we, the Brits, had won a team medal up, up till that point. And I remember being last to go in the team competition on the mare that I had there, Balotero, who's the mother of my current horse. And the, I re just remember because of the closeness of that arena, the riding through that test and although i was holding my breath i felt everybody was holding their breath and i really felt everybody in that audience was we were all as one it was a bit of a surreal experience actually and you know a lovely experience and it was great for us all and and we we got a medal i can't remember <laughs> it was a silver or a bronze but we got we got the medal and it was great and the sad bit of course about it is you know that dane Rawlins, Nayland Moore and Rawlins, who have organised just after Dickstead for donkey's years, you know, are not able to continue doing that. And that's obviously, you know, has great memories for, for me personally. Um, and, you know, it's been fantastic for British dressage um, that what they, the contribution they've made. So we're here with Caroline Powell uh, <laughs> and we're catching up with her between rides. Caroline, who are you with here? <laughs> he looks very beautiful. Um, I'm with a five-year-old horse. He actually is a four-year-old, um, went to Birdie in the Birdie Young Event Horse class. So he is um, hopefully going to be a young and up-and-coming horse that um, we'll get to Birdie at some stage. So yeah, he's called Louis, legally grey, Louis Lambert. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, that leads us really nicely into some of our questions. Um, do you think it does take a particular horse to go around Burley? Um, yeah, no, it does take, it takes a very special horse to go around Burley. Um, usually they are um, <laughs> a bit mad like we are. Um, you know, in, in the experience that I've had, they're usually horses that, um, you know, are a little bit sort of quirky. Um, not really all that straightforward and you know they they have got to be so brave to go around early my god those fences are big um you know the, the standard of dressage and show jumping at the moment you know so they've got to be good movers they've got to be good jumpers and they've got to be big and bold and brave so um yeah it, it does take very 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 special horse to to get around early let alone wooden early yeah, absolutely. So, with, with your with your Burley winner, can can you tell us please a little bit more about Lenamore and and your incredible career with him? He was a very quirky horse. Um, you know, there were quite a few things that we couldn't do. Um, you know, riding for the dressage was was one of them. Um, um, I was very very lucky to be asked to ride um, Lenamore. We call him Ed at home. Um, Lexi um, Jackson uh, got a job in London, and she decided that you know the horse. Having one or two horses is, is quite difficult to, to keep at that level. Um, and at the time I was up in Scotland and they were not far from Scotland. And so, you know, everything sort of worked quite well. Um, McKinnons and I are uh, still to this day um, very, very close because of the connection we've got with Lenore. Um But yeah, he was, a, he was a quite a funny little horse to work. Um, Jamie, uh, Lexi's mum, did all the preparation for him. So she used to do six weeks walking, which I think, you know, great credit to them um which is why he kept so so sound for so long and you you competed at him at the top level up until um he was 19 and um, going to the olympics in 2012 
that, that's an incredible career for a top class um, horse. I was reading your stats and I'm just going to grab my piece of paper because I couldn't remember them. 26 international competitions, two Olympics, one World Games, seven badmintons, top 10 in four, five burleys and they're in the top six in four. It's just absolutely, absolutely incredible. Um, and I think top, yeah. top um, British eventing points. Um, so... What do you credit his longevity? How, how, that's just remarkable. Well, you know, like I said before, I think a lot of it's got to do with, you know, Janie would just spend hours and hours and hours walking him. <clears throat> so, you know, and I think, I think that's what we miss a lot now because most of those events would have been long format as well. So, you know, you had your roads and tracks and your steeple yeah. jacks. And, <clears throat> um, he only ever used to run you know, twice before a, a big event or maybe even once. And I don't think he ever missed... Uh, uh, you know, two, two, three days in in the year. Um, you know, he was a he was a he was a horse. He lived within his box. He knew exactly how far he could he could throw himself. Um, you know, he he used to jog a lot when he was at hacking. Um, you know, he used to muck around in the dressage arena and, and when you were schooling him and stuff. So, but he always knew exactly what his limits were. Um, and he, he stayed within his box just so nicely that um, you know I think that had a lot to do with him, do do with his his longevity and his career. Um, but yeah, no, he was he and he was only tiny. He was probably it says on the passport he was fifteen three, but I don't think he was. He was more like fifteen one, fifteen hands. Um, so you know he was little and he was compact and he had perfect conformation. Um, and you know he's still he's still living up in Yorkshire and still still going strong. So that's that's incredible. Who that's knows? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know he 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 loved Billy. He um, I remember that. I mean, the day or the year that he won Burley, he came off the lorry and he just, he just oozed, oozed sort of look at me presence. And um, he never put a foot wrong the whole time he was at Burley, which was really unusual. You know, usually we'd have one, one sort of bit where you think, God, he'd just give me a break and, and you know, behave yourself. But the whole of Burley, he was absolutely spot on. It was lovely. What qualities are most important to you when you're choosing a horse? And does it depend on the discipline, the level, or, or do you know? Do you look for something else entirely? No, um, most of the horses we've got now are um, three-year-olds. <laughs> Kisses there. Um, so you know we've, we've had them broken and, and brought them on and brought them through. So um, you know we've got a great big batch coming through now. They're sort of seven-year-old, um, you know, down to down to four-year-olds. Um, but a lot of the horses I've had at, at four star and um, five star level now, um, you know, I've had a few few ones that I've bought through myself. But you know, when I go and have a look at horses, I'm looking for, you know, the confirmation has to be right. They've, they've got to be within their box. They've got to be very comfortable in themselves. Um, they've got to have a nice attitude. You know, and mostly when I ride them, I want to get back on them. I wake up in the morning thinking about them, what you know, thinking about what I'm going to do, not thinking, oh God, I've got to go and ride such and such. So you know. To me, I can jump across pole and I know whether I want to work with the horse or not. Um, you know, we're very, very lucky because we've got a great stable of really lovely jumpers. Um, and, you know, to go out and buy young horses and to actually get them through to badminton and bird and birdies, um, it's, it's, oh, it's a huge mammoth from everybody, you know, whether it's the owners or the grooms, and everybody has great you know, partnerships with them, that they just... Um, you know, it's a it's a huge thing, <laughs> but um, you know, there's so many lovely horses out there. But if if I could ride one horse around Burley one more time, it would be Lenore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and if it's given you an appetite for even more things Burley, then why don't you tune in to Burley's own website at 3 p.m. on Sunday the 6th, where Claire Balding will be introducing another all-star lineup. Thank you very much. Thank you.